Hey guys, welcome to our Wednesday night video Bible study. We're in Judges 12 tonight. If last week, Judges 11, was one of my favorite chapters in the whole Bible because of theology, tonight we'll get one of my favorite passages because of the story. This won't be a memorable story for everyone, but it's just one of those stories, especially with the backdrop, um, that I don't know, I've always liked ever since I discovered it in the scriptures. So if last week was um, a super machine gun talk, rapid fire talk into the depths of some theology, especially concerning the sovereignty and authority of God, and this week is, is a bit of a wild story and then three other tiny stories thrown in. Uh, it certainly has a place and a purpose in the scripture or else the Lord wouldn't have given it to us. Um, but with, uh, without further ado, let's, let's uh, open in prayer and then turn to a rather short Judges chapter number 12. And uh, let's look at uh, uh, the end of the story of Jephthah and the quick three stories of three other judges, Ibzan, Elon, and Abdon. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for a chance to dig into your word. Your word is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. Your word is profitable for instruction, for growth, for equipping the saints for every good work. Your word, Father, is not merely an academic literary work of the of the intellect your word is living and active and sharper than a double-edged sword able to pierce us through sinew and bone and muscle all the way through our soul so father as we look at your word we know your word will be looking at us more than anything through your word we want to see you Help us now, we beg. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so um, it's just 15 verses in Judges chapter 12. So let's just start out by reading every single verse in order. Beginning at Judges chapter 12, verse number 1. The men of Ephraim were called to arms, and they crossed to Zaphon and said to Jephthah, Why did you cross over to fight against the Ammonites and did not call us to go with you? We will burn your house over you with fire. Pretty strong verse one. And Jephthah said to them, I and my people had a great dispute with the Ammonites. And when I called you, you did not come to save me from their hand. And when I saw that you would not save me, I took my life in my hand and crossed over against the Ammonites. And the Lord gave them into my hand. Why then have you come up to me this day to fight against me? Then Jephthah gathered all the men of Gilead and fought with Ephraim. And the men of Gilead struck Ephraim because they said, you are fugitives of Ephraim, you Gileadites in the midst of Ephraim and Manasseh. And the Gileadites captured the fords of the Jordan against the Ephraimites. And when any of the fugitives of Ephraim said, let me go over, the men of Gilead said to him, are you an Ephraim, Ephraimite? When they said no, they said to him, Then say Shibboleth. And he said Sibboleth. For he could not pronounce it right. Then they seized him and slaughtered him at the fords of the Jordan. At that time, 42,000 Ephraimites fell. Jephthah judged Israel six years. Then Jephthah the Gilead, Gileadite was, died and was buried in his city in Gilead. After him, Ibzan of Bethlehem judged Israel. He had 30 sons and 30 daughters. He gave in marriage outside his clan. And 30 daughters he brought in from outside for his sons. And he judged Israel seven years. Then Ibzan died and was buried at Bethlehem. After him, Elon the Zebulonite judged Israel, and he judged Israel 10 years. Then Elon the Zebulonite died and was buried at Aijalon in the land of Zebulun. After him, Abdon, the son of Hillel, the uh, Pirithonite, Hillel, the Pirithonite, judged Israel. 
he had 40 sons and 30 grandsons who rode on 70 donkeys, and he judged Israel eight years. Then Abdon, the son of Hillel, the Pirathonite, died and was buried at Pirathon in the land of Ephraim in the hill country of the Amalekites. Whew. Got rocky out at the end, didn't it, with all those names? Okay, so we finish the story of Jephthah today that uh, we started in Judges chapter 11. We finished that up in the greater portion, or at least that's not true, the, the half portion, seven of the 15 verses of Judges 12, also continue Jephthah's story. Now, we have to we have to go back a bit in time to get the whole story of what's going on here with these with these Eph- Ephraimites. So if you would, if you got your Bibles, back up to Judges chapter 8. Now you'll remember Judges chapter 8 is um, when um, it's, in, it's in the part of, uh, of Gideon's story. And uh, remember Gideon's story uh, really comes to us in three whole chapters, uh, 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 6, 7, and 8. And he gets these great victories. So we're looking here at Judges 8, verses 1 through 3. And uh, and these men of Ephraim, Ephraim then, this was some time ago, but they say this. The men of Ephraim said to him, what is this you have done to us now not to call us to fight when you fight against Midian? And they accused him fiercely. And he said to them, what have I done now in comparison with you? Is not the gleaning of grapes of Ephraim better than the grapes of the harvest of Ebiezer? God has given into your hands the princes of Midian, Orb and Zeb. What have I been able to do in comparison with you? Then their anger against him subsided when he said this. Okay, the Eph- Ephraimites apparently were people who didn't really want to fight, but they wanted reward. That's that's the conclusion we're left to draw. Um, boy, you talk about how the world is. Uh, this That's a great illustration of how the world is. A lot of people want reward without labor. They want reward without risk. That's why I love, I love in the story of Jephthah, he says, you guys didn't come out to help me, so I took my life into my own hands. And what he's saying here is, you guys didn't come out and trust the Lord to go to war with us, but I trusted the Lord at the expense, or stake rather, at the stake, at the risk of my own life. How Gideon handled that in Judges chapter 8 is through diplomacy. Jephthah is not given to such diplomacy in this case. Let's look at the story. There's a conflict here. And let's look. This is so interesting. I'm telling you. This is so interesting because this story is literally still informing and reverberating through history, even up to the day, literally. Okay, so let's look at the story in detail. You know the background. We've already had problems uh, with these uh, Ephraimites before. They, they were mad at Gideon. They wanted reward without risk. And now, apparently, we're seeing this again some decades later. They want reward without risk. Um, I can tell you, that can become the patterns of people and people groups, uh, communities and cultures to want reward without risk. I think we see that today. We, um, you know, you know, nobody wants to be forced into socialism, right? Nobody does. Nobody wants to be forced into some people work really hard and are wise and then somebody comes along, and takes your stuff and gives it to other people. Nobody likes that. Socialism, communism. Right, but Christians are to choose that a lot as an act of worship. We we are diligent and persevering, trusting in the Lord, uh, laborious with our with our hands, uh, frugal, good stewards with with our, our, our attitudes and our actions, and then we should choose hospitality and generosity, radical generosity. Right, but nobody likes to be forced to do stuff like that. There's a big attitude of that in these days. I want to go get the reward, but I don't want to take the risk. I want to get the fruit without the labor. This is nothing new we're facing here. Except the Ephraimites have not run up 
on Diplomatic Gideon. They have run up on, uh, let's call it <laughs> Desperado Jephthah. If you remember from chapter 11, he rode out with a bad band of fellows. You know, cue the Eagles music. Desperado, why don't you come to your senses? Well, he did. He was called of the Lord to do a great work, to work as a judge of Israel, to save them in this, um, in this conflict against the Ammonites. He rose to the occasion. There's been a, a victory. There's reward. There's honor. There's glory to be had. And now the Ephraimites are mad. Go back and look at verse number one. They want to know, why didn't you involve us? And he said, fellas, I did. And uh, they basically tell him in verse number one, um, we'll burn your house down with you in it. As a matter of fact, it's not we will, okay? Well, I mean, that's what it says, but it's not like we might do this. What they're saying is we're going. That's what I'm pointing out in the in the languages here. It's not we will in the sense of I threaten you now. It is we're telling you we're going to burn your house down with you in it. Um, uh, see, I don't know how y'all would feel about that, but I'd be a little upset too. Again, especially considering the history with these people. So how does Jephthah respond to this? Okay, Jephthah makes this a spiritual conversation first. How does he do that? He makes it a spiritual conversation. You say, preacher, where does he make it a spiritual conversation? Um, look at the latter part of verse 3. Uh, he says, uh, the Lord gave them into my hand. Okay. It is a heavy accusation, a heavy condemnation that Jephthah puts on these Ephraimites. He's going, um, uh, yeah, I trusted the Lord to the risk of my life. You guys didn't. And the Lord gave us a victory. He is basically saying, y'all didn't trust the Lord, and I did. Now, y'all going to mess with a man who trusts the Lord? It's a good question. It's a good question. In other words, non-diplomatic Jephthah, or let's just say the not Gideon Jephthah. Uh, remember, Gideon struggled with fear. Gideon struggled with, uh, with, with uh, you know, believing God's, you know, having God's vision, believing God's plan, um, and and you know, God God worked with him all the way along. Well. Here we got Jephthah. Jephthah. Jephthah's basically saying, I trusted the Lord, you didn't. Now you fooling with a man who's trusting the Lord. Are you sure you want to do that? You cannot make this stuff up. As a side gig, as a side gig, um, I used to repo things. Um, around here and to stay local, there there wasn't a ton of vehicles that uh, got to repo. That was where the money was. But I um, I did uh, contract out my services to many rent-to-own and equipment rental businesses too. Uh, a lot of times a phone call or a visit to somebody would straighten everything out. They would get their account out of arrears or gently surrender whatever it was that was needing to be repossessed. But sometimes there were these cases that were difficult to solve. And um, there was a, a uh, season in my life where I had a certain sort of attitude and fortitude that um, uh, made me very willing and able to deal with, certain, with difficult situations. So you can't make this stuff up. I go to see this guy and basically Basically, the vast majority of his appliances and some of his furniture had to be repossessed. I take no joy in this. I'd rather work it out peacefully. You know, um, I you know I was authorized to have all sorts of conversations with people, like 
hey, you need your stove and refrigerator, so why don't I take these things and you'll, you know, you know your TV and this and that, and you'll be able to afford, you know, get back right with those things. And Well, I'll never forget, um, I was carrying a couple of firearms because it could get sort of dicey, and um, I'll never forget this guy opened the door of his house and let basically the head and the head and shoulders of a, a very loud, vicious looking Rottweiler, you know, he, he let him out the door and he's behind the door and he's, he's yelling and a dog is barking and, you know, it sounds quite contentious, you know, and I've pulled up on this, on this uh, box truck, you know, where I can fit things in and I've, uh, as soon as he does that, the guy who I had working with me to help me carry things, he he just jumps in the, in the vehicle, slams the door, and basically is down, sort of in the floorboard in the seat. And the guy yells out, "You better you better get out of here before before I turn my dog loose on you." Um, I I, I pulled out uh, the larger of the weapons with me, and I and I yelled back. I says, don't do that. I said, I've got a dog that barks in my hand and bites all the way through that door. And the guy pulls the dog back and he steps out and he goes, uh, 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 what can I do for you guys? <laughs> when I read this, maybe that's why I, th I think this passage is so great. When I read this passage, they say, uh, Hey, we're gonna burn your house down with you in it. And Jessica goes, hmm. the, the Lord's with me. The old adage, you're bringing a knife to a gunfight here. And so we see in verses four through six what happens. Go back to verse four. The man then Jephthah gathered up his men, and Ephraim gathered up their folks, and, and they had a fight. They had a battle. And um, the men of Ephraim were defeated. Um, as one commentator says, uh, one group one group seemed really good at talking, and the other group seemed really good at fighting. Amen. Amen, indeed. Um, was this the wisest course of action? Nowhere in the Bible does it confirm that it is the wisest course of action. Nowhere in the Bible does it say it's not. I guess some lesson we could learn here is sometimes it's time for diplomacy and sometimes it's time for war. And that would that would that would agree. If you guys remember some months ago we were going through Ecclesiastes, that would agree with Ecclesiastes three, wouldn't it? Uh, in Ecclesiastes three, we we learn there's a there's a time and a place for most everything, right? Um, there's a time Ecclesiastes chapter three verse eight, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. And uh, one of the great challenges in life is to know when we let some things go and when we don't let some things go, when we saw some things through diplomacy, and when we saw some things through. Definitive action. It's not always war. Sometimes you can't um, you can't uh, slide away from something. You got to kill it. You know. When I was a little boy, we were we were uh, in a field that we had noticed had a lot of these snakes. We called them blue racers. I don't know what the official name was, but they, them, them, them guys would stand up. And so my brothers were trying to wait for them to stand you know they'd rise up and they were trying to shoot them with a 22 and uh and uh we stopped the shooting and i was walking across the field and one of those guys stood up on me well uh if you ever been chased by a chicken <laughs> you know when something gets after you you're a lot faster than uh the normal well when that uh when that snake stood up you know, uh, stood up. Uh, I, I did not try to behave with diplomacy. <laughs> I ran. I got out of there, right? And if you were to ask me, where is that snake? It felt like with my my uh, Spider-Man, my Spidey sense, felt like it was right behind me, but it was nowhere near me. 
there's a time and place for things. And the uh, Jephthah and the Gileadites feel like this is the time for war. Now you have this very interesting thing that happens. They take the ford, the place where you cross the stream. Okay, They take the ford of the Jordan, a crossing of the Jordan, uh, where the Ephraimites, Ephraimites would be going back home. And um, as people are straggling back from this conflict between uh, the Gileadite, Gileadites and the Ephraimites, they, um, they stop each person to say, are you an Ephraimite? And, and if they say, they say, no, we're, we're, we're not Ephraimites. We're just crossing the Jordan. We got some business over here. They say, okay, pronounce the word Shibboleth. Whatever dialect the Ephraimites had, they could not pronounce the H in Shibboleth. Whatever the problem was, they would say it, Sibboleth. Now, you might think that sounds like a strange test. It's not. It's not even the only time that language proves something in the Bible. If you'll remember, when Peter tries to deny that he was a follower of Jesus in Matthew 26, they say, we know your accent. This is one of these cases. They know these guys' accents. And for whatever reason, these uh, Ephraimites could not pronounce the H or did not, or it was not their custom. It was not part of their linguistic syntax and structure. So they would say Sibboleth. To this day, to this day, that word is in use. Shibboleth is in use because of this passage. Uh, shibboleth, these, uh, a shibboleth today means an acid test um, to see if something is what it claims to be. It is a proof test. It comes from right here in this story. This story's significance is reverberating all throughout even modern history, okay? Um, and you know, it's not always how things are pronounced that are a shibboleth uh, in, in language terms. It's sometimes how you talk about them. Like some people will talk about Jesus like he's just a nice guy, while other people will talk about Jesus like he is God of very God, Lord of Lords, King of Kings, and there's a massive difference. So what do you believe about Jesus? We could we could use several things, a shibboleths, to see if you know the real Jesus or you know some Jesus of your own manufacture. Okay. And then in one verse, they tell us about the rest of Jephthah's time judging Israel. It says he judged Israel six years in verse 7. Then he died and was buried in Gilead. And there's the story of Jephthah. And it ends with this wild story. We're going to burn your house down around you. Hmm. You guys wouldn't trust God. I trust God. Bring it on. And then they, um, they use language. They use accents. It's a wild story. I told you guys I love it. And, you know, then it just says, and he, he reigned for a while longer, and he died, and they buried him. And then secondly today, that was firstly, firstly to finish the story of Jephthah. And again, you see the sovereignty issue. I should have brought this up. You see the sovereignty issue brought up again with Jephthah. You say, you know, he says, and uh, uh, the Lord gave them into my hand. In other words, he did not perceive his victory on the battlefield as his victory, but that God had done it and he had been there for, you know, as a witness and a, as a witness and a um, beneficiary to what God had done. Now, second part, we got these three judges and they give us, uh, you know, what is it? Seven, uh, no, eight verses to talk about three guys they gave us three chapters to talk about, uh, you know, Gideon, a chapter and a half to talk about uh, uh, Jephthah, uh, uh, 
And now they're going to give us eight verses to talk about Ibzan, Elon, and uh, Abdon. So let's do it. Um, verses 8 through 10 give us the story of Ibzan, okay? And it says he's from Bethlehem. And, and I, I, before this study, during the study, uh, up until yesterday, when I was finishing up my notes, I assumed this was the uh, Bethlehem, as in where 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 Dave, King David was from, where where the Lord Jesus was born. But scholars seem to believe that this wasn't Bethlehem in Judah, but it was Bethlehem in uh, Zebulun. It still means the house of bread, right? And that and uh, you know I want to be honest. Um, uh, the many scholars believe that, and so I'm going to go with it. But without the aid of these many study tools, um, and there's you know there's a wall full of them. Without the aid of these many study tools, I would have thought that this guy was from the same town as uh, uh, Jesus and uh, King David. And so um, it was interesting to to find that. It's not a big deal. It was just interesting. Um, but here's what's very interesting. Okay. It doesn't tell us that he had a lot of wives or mistresses or whatever. But one is left to believe that because he's got 30 sons and he's got 30 daughters. And if they all came from one woman. Boy, right? That's troublesome. <laughs> right? Um, but he has 30, 30 sons and 30 daughters and he marries off all the daughters and he marries off all the sons. Okay. Um, it tells us that, uh, uh, he gave those 30 daughters in marriage and, uh, it tells that in verse number nine, and then he brought in 30 daughters for his sons. Okay. It's important that we recognize what this is really talking about. This means he has created a ton of um, alliances through marriage. He has aligned his family with uh, many other families. Now, some of these daughters could have married brothers. Some of these sons could have married sisters or cousins or whatever. Um, you know, from you know, brides and grooms from the same families, whatever. The point is uh, not that necessarily that uh, Ibzan connected his family with 60 other families, but it is that he connected his family with many other families. Now, why is this important? I think this judge used, um, used marriage to create uh, uh, unity amongst many peoples and peace through many peoples. There was a common interest by people being connected. I think that's what it's meaning to convey to us, okay? And it probably is also meant to convey to us that he is also financially very stable, if not wealthy. Uh, if he could get 30 dowries from his daughters-in-law, if he could afford to give 30 dowries for his uh, sons-in-laws, um, you know, for his daughters uh, as they married his sons-in-laws, I think we can deduce that he was a man who used relationships and resources to uh, create connection. Uh, of these three judges, secondly, we get Elon. Now, here in North Carolina, that just sounds like a town name to us or a, or a university or college name. Elon uh, over there in the town of Elon, sort of near Burlington and Liberty and around that area. Um, but in the Bible, it's Elon the... Zebulonite. Now, it's very interesting. They don't tell us much. He judged Israel for 10 years. He was a Zebulonite, and he died, and he was buried. Here's the detail, okay? He's not in the tribe of Ephraim. He's not in the tribe of Gilead. He's from the tribe of Zebulun. God raised up judges from amongst different tribes. I think that's the great lesson. Finally, among these three minor judges, we get the judge Abdon. Um, now, th this one to me 
is a is an interesting case study. I'll tell you why. Uh, number one, it says he has forty sons and thirty grandsons. So that's seventy, but they ride around on seventy donkeys. Now, what in the world does that have anything to do with anything? That means they're wealthy. Um, it means they have great influence. Um, it means that they uh, are using their wealth and their family connection to to rule. Um, and we're, we're left to assume, uh, and, and history doesn't argue, the Bible doesn't say it, and history doesn't argue what the Bible says. We're left to assume that through his wealth and his many sons and um, their their um, their ability to, to travel um, peacefully, it seems. It seems that that's what the land enjoyed was peace. But here's here's a little nugget, okay? Here's a little nugget. Uh, they are uh, they are from uh, Pirithon. In other words, they're uh, Abdon, son of Hillel, the Purithonite, okay? You say, what's that got to do with anything? I want you to pause for a second. I want you to hold your spot here in Judges. Put your bookmark there in Judges. And I want you to find your way with me over to 2 Samuel 23. 2 Samuel 23. Uh, right here. 2 Samuel 23. Look all the way down at uh, verse number 30. Okay. Oh. Um, David's uh, starting in Second uh, Samuel chapter twenty-three, verse eight. They start naming David's mighty men. Okay, these uh, these guys. Uh, they have. If you read the whole account, starting in verse eight, a lot of them have done some great deeds, right? But look at verse thirty. Uh, Benaiah of Parathon, Hindi of the brooks of Gaash. I'll say. Beniah of Parathon. Okay. This is one of David's mighty men. This is one of his captains. Okay. Where is he from? Parathon. What's that got to do with anything? He is from the same people group as Abdon, the son of Hillel. And I just think that's very interesting. Whenever you see a name in the Bible, uh, cross-reference it and see the connections. Um, here's another important connection. Um, they lived in Ephraim in the hill country of the Amalekites, okay? Um, you remember it was the Amalekites in Exodus 17 who preyed upon, not prayed, not prayed for, but preyed upon the weakest of those uh, Israelites who were making the, their uh, sojourn in the wilderness. And so um, they... Uh, they were Abdon, this pure, 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 pure This Pirithonite is living out there on the edge of some sort of treacherous people. Um, so let's let's draw some conclusions from from each of these things. All right, um, conclusions and applications. Again, we're faced with sovereignty here. Who picks who? God picks these guys, raises them up as judges. Okay, sovereignty. Who wins battles? God. Whoever he uses, whatever he uses, it is God who is victorious. Okay, amen. What can we learn from Jephthah? Um, there's a time and place for everything. If Gideon used diplomacy against Ephraim, uh, Jephthah does not use diplomacy. He uses brutality. He uses war. Um, and I just think that's, it's very, very interesting, okay? What can we learn from Ibzan? Um, I think we can learn the value of relational connection. Who do we know and what sort of peace uh, can we offer together through the people we know? What sort of blessing can we share together? I think that's important. What can we learn from, from Elon? Uh, I think we can learn that, uh, you know, God, uh, God, God doesn't just use one type of person. God doesn't use, um, you know, uh, not only one type. One, he he doesn't he doesn't he he'll use anybody. I should just say it in the positive. I kept trying to think of the negative. 
He'll use different people. And that's very important. God will put into his service all sorts of people. Okay. Um, and uh, sometimes, sometimes the second lesson, we don't know much about Zebulun. Praise God. Maybe, maybe there's not a lot to tell. Maybe they're, they're living that goal of being at peace with the world around them. What an important goal. And then what can we learn from uh, Abdon? I think the, the, the chief thing we can learn from Abdon is that uh, God doesn't always position us in the places of the greatest safety. Sometimes he positions us in the place of the greatest challenge. And then what will we direct our son, our, our, excuse me, our families to be and to do? It, it's, you know, I believe what this means when they tell us he has 40 sons and 30 grandsons is he deployed his family in the, uh, in the work of peace in the kingdom. And so if, you know, if you add it up, uh, we got, uh, you know, uh, you got the years of Abdon, you got the, the years of, um, of Elon, you got the years of, of Ibzan, you got the years of Jephthah. And so what we see here is, uh, we see a story of, uh, about 35 years, you know, about 35 years, six, six from, uh, uh, Jephthah, seven from, from Ibzan, uh, 10 years from Elon and, um, uh, I think it was 10 years from, from, uh, Abdon as well. Um, no, eight years. So that's, uh, uh, eight. 18, 25, 31 years. 31 years of relative peace uh, because the people who God called out to serve, they obeyed him and served. I wonder, I wonder then, as some, as some points of challenge and exhortation, I wonder are we the kind of people that would obey God at the risk of our lives? Are, are we those kind of people who will take take the risk uh, or just take the reward? Um, secondly, do we imagine do we imagine that uh, God only uses a certain type or more pointedly that he wouldn't use us? Um, that's good old-fashioned hogwash. God will use all kinds of people. Uh, are we are we raising up our families in the service of the Lord? Now, the, the greater point of judges uh, is that people fail and need God. And, and if we don't uh, if we don't walk with God very closely, we will have gross failure. But there's all sorts of good, neat application in it, too. Um, more than anything, more than anything in this passage, I see how uh, people really want the blessings God offers to bestow, but they don't want the relationship or the risk that comes with it. And that's a great reminder for me as I looked at Judges chapter 12 tonight. Thank you guys for listening. Peace.